was sharing with uh, Randy Wolf yesterday that one of my favorite things about being a pastor is that I am often invited into people's lives in some of their most difficult times. Uh, it provides me the opportunity to see the way that God sustains the faith of His people uh, in the midst of suffering. And I'm always amazed at how God provides His people with just enough grace to face the difficulty that they are experiencing at the time. You see, the truth is that we never know what lies just ahead in our lives. Uh, we never know what difficulty may be just around the corner. But one thing that we do know is that our God is faithful. That He will never leave us nor forsake us. And that we can trust in Him. And so our scripture for this morning's sermon reminds us that whatever may come, keep trusting God. And so I'm going to read Esther chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 19. And I'll read through chapter 3, verse 15. So chapter 2, verse 19, through the end of chapter 3. And if you're able, I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Hear now the Word of God. Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people, as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai. And he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman, in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast her, that is, they cast lots, before Haman day after day. And they cast it month after month till the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There are certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. And I will pay ten thousand talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the thirteenth day of the first month, and an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script, 
and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for this study of Esther. We thank you for the things that you have taught us already. And Father, we believe that there are uh, other things that you would desire to teach us this morning. That you are, uh, through your word, conforming us more and more to the image of your son Jesus. And so, Father, we pray that you would continue that work this morning in each one of our lives. I pray that you would give us ears to hear. I pray that you would give me clarity of speech. I pray that your spirit would speak to each one of us, that we would go from this place changed. Father, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. This is our fourth sermon in Esther, and the narrative is moving along rather quickly at this point. We've seen a lot already, but there's still plenty more for us to consider in the weeks ahead. But as we look at our text this morning, we see that it provides us with one strong answer to three pressing questions. One strong answer to three pressing questions. The first question that I think our text draws us to ask this morning is, what do you do when your good deeds are forgotten? What do you do when your good deeds are forgotten? And I, I wonder if you've ever felt like your good deeds had been forgotten. Like you did something good for someone, like you took care of someone, you, you met a need that someone had, and that deed was simply forgotten. They, they forgot all about what you had done. I think we've probably all had that experience in our lives at one time or another. We don't always get the credit that we think we deserve. And this is exactly what happened to Mordecai in our text this morning. You remember that we were introduced to Mordecai last week? We saw that Mordecai was a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. We saw that his ancestors had been taken away into captivity with Jeconiah, who was the king of Judah at the time. We saw that this happened during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon. And apparently, when King Cyrus allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem, Mordecai decided to stay in Susa. We also learned last week that Mordecai raised his cousin Hadassah, or Esther, as we know her. Esther's parents had died. She had become an orphan, and so Mordecai raised her as his own. And at this point in the narrative, Esther is now the queen. She's the queen. She's in the palace. She's with King Ahasuerus. And we looked at the events that led to her becoming queen last week. And so Esther is now the queen, and Mordecai, as you look at verse 19, is sitting at the king's gate. And we're not told exactly why he's at the king's gate on this particular occasion. But if you look back at verse 11, you'll see that Mordecai was very concerned about Esther. And that every day he would go and he would check on her to make sure that she was okay. And I think that's probably exactly what he's doing here. He wants to make sure that Esther is okay. He's waiting to, to see Esther or to get word from someone that has, Esther is doing okay. And so there's Mordecai, he's sitting by the king's gate, he's waiting for Esther. And then we're introduced to two guys, Bigthan and Teresh. They were two of the king's eunuchs, and they uh, had apparently had enough of King Ahasuerus. Because as Mordecai was sitting by the king's gate, he overheard these two guys, and 
they were talking and they were plotting and they were, they were talking about Ahasuerus. They were plotting about what they were going to do about King Ahasuerus. They were, they were angry with the king for one reason or another. They wanted to have him killed. It really shouldn't be surprising to us in light of what we already know about King Ahasuerus that he would have some enemies. That there would be some people in Susa that would want him dead. And that's exactly what was going on. But as Mordecai heard this, we know that Mordecai was a loyal guy. He was submissive to authority, even when the authority over him was evil. And so he told Esther of the plot between Bigthan and Teresh to kill Ahasuerus. Esther then told the king there was an investigation. Mordecai's report proved to be true. The Bible tells us that Big Than and Teresh were both hanged on the gallows. And this was a clear sign to everyone. You interfere in the royal affairs and the same fate will await you as well. You don't mess with a Ahasuerus. You see, Ahasuerus was a bit of a bully. You can understand why he would do this, but he was a, big, a bit of a bully in, in every area of his life. He, he ruled with fear and intimidation. But what about Mordecai? I mean, Mordecai saved the king's life. I mean, if, if Mordecai had not reported this plan of these two guys to King Ahasuerus, we don't know what might have happened, but if they had been successful, Ahasuerus would have ended up dead. And what thanks did Mordecai get for saving the king's life? Nothing. Nothing at all. No feast in his honor from this king who loved to party. Not even a certificate recognizing his loyalty. He got nothing. Nothing at all. Except verse 23, it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. File that away in your brain, because while it may seem insignificant now, and, and a small thanks to Mordecai for saving the king's life, it will become very important later. But can you imagine how Mordecai must have felt? I mean, he's just saved the king's life. The king was in danger, and Mordecai not reported what was being plotted against him. Well, we don't know any details about Mordecai's motives in reporting this coup attempt to the king. Maybe he was just an extremely loyal guy, and while he knew that Ahasuerus was an evil king, he was still the king, and so he reasoned honor to whom honor is due. Maybe he was simply looking out for Esther, who was now the queen. He knew that if the king was killed, that would put her position in jeopardy. Maybe he was hoping that saving the king's life would result in some kind of reward. But I think whatever his motive in reporting this plot to King Ahasuerus, whatever his motive in saving Ahasuerus' life, he had to have been at least a little bit disappointed. And all of that happened was recorded in the book of the Chronicles, file it away, and that's it. His good deed went forgotten. And I think that this morning we can probably relate to Mordecai in this. And the fact that his good deed went forgotten. I mean, maybe you've never saved someone's life from some sinister plot on behalf of their enemies. But have you ever felt like your good deeds were forgotten? You didn't get the credit that you thought you deserved. Well, what did you do? How, how did you respond in that situation where you didn't get the credit for the good deed that you thought you should have Receive. What, what should we do when our good deeds are forgotten? Friends, I want to suggest to you this morning that the thing you should do when your good deeds are forgotten is keep trusting God. In fact, I think we see this answer very clearly in Esther. It's not evident yet because Mordecai is forgotten and the narrative just kind of moves on. In fact, if you read the story of Esther, it gets worse before it gets better. We're going to find out in chapter 3 that Ahasuerus was looking for a right-hand man. And who could he have chosen? He could have chosen Mordecai. Mordecai had already proven his loyalty. That would be a great reward for Mordecai to receive after saving the king's life. Instead, he went with someone else. Goshen, this is not the end of the story, is it? 
Mordecai's good deed may have been forgotten by a hasteress, but understand it was not forgotten by God. God will later remind a hasteress of what Mordecai did for him. And then Mordecai will receive his reward. But for now, it seemed as if Mordecai's good deed had been forgotten. And friends, the same is true in our lives. Our good deeds may go unnoticed or forgotten by men. But understand that nothing we do is ever unnoticed or forgotten by God. One of the things that grieves me most as a pastor is my own failure at times to show proper appreciation to those of you who faithfully serve this church in so many ways. Sometimes it's because I don't know about something you do and so I can't show appreciation. Sometimes it's because I forget that you, what you did or I forget to show appreciation. And still other times it's because I'm too boneheaded to stop and recognize your faithful service. Just take it for granted. But I want you to know that while I may not know about something you did, or I may forget to appreciate you, or, or whatever it may be, realize, Goshen, that God knows. Or realize that He sees and eventually, He will reward. Keep trusting God. The same is true in other areas of our lives as well. You go to work, work hard day after day, week after week, year after year, and you wonder if anyone ever notices all the things that you do. You look at all that you do and you think, this company would be in real trouble if it weren't for me. And it seems like nobody here even notices, nobody here even recognizes all that I do, not even the boss. Certainly not the boss. Understand that God knows. He sees. Work heartily as for the Lord and not for men and keep trusting God. Or maybe you do something for a friend. You do something for a family member. You meet a need. You uh, take care of, of a situation or whatever it might be. And they seem to just forget about it. They don't appreciate it. Or worse, they turn around and betray you after you've done something nice for them. Maybe you've experienced that in your life. Understand that God knows. God sees. Keep trusting Him. What do you do when your good deeds are forgotten? You keep trusting God. Number two, what do you do when evil rises to power? What do you do when evil rises to power? We've, we've already seen that King Ahasuerus was an evil man. He was prideful and selfish. He lived for the praise of men. He indulged his flesh with alcohol. He gave himself to sexual immorality. He treated other people, image bearers of God, as if they existed for Him, as if they existed for His own gratification. He was consumed with one thing, Himself. That, that was His entire focus, a hasteress. But now in chapter 3, we're introduced to another evil man. And his name is Haman. He's an Agagite, which will become important in a moment. He's the son of Hamadatha. And Ahasuerus promoted him to what seems like second in command in the kingdom. He's the king's right-hand man. This was a big deal for Haman to be promoted to this position of prominence. In fact, the Bible tells us he even got a throne. Haman is suddenly a big deal. In fact, he was such a big deal that King Ahasuerus commanded all his servants who were at the king's gates to bow down and to pay homage to Haman. That's exactly what everyone did. Well, everyone except for Mordecai. We don't know exactly why Mordecai wouldn't bow down to Haman. The text doesn't answer that question for us. It is the question that the servants at the gate asked him. They said, why do you transgress the king's command? But the text doesn't tell us why Mordecai wouldn't bow down. Some have said it was because Mordecai was jealous of Haman that he had gotten this position of power and influence instead of him. Others have said it was because Haman was an Agagite and the Jews hated the Agagites. 
We really don't know for sure why Mordecai wouldn't bow down. But I think most likely it was because of Mordecai's commitment to the one true God. He would only bow before God. And I think the reason the author of Esther doesn't tell us is because he or she is very intentionally leaving out any references to God in the book. Remember, there's not a single reference to God in the book of Esther. And so the, the author of Esther skips this detail so as not to mention God. He's telling the story where God is in complete control, accomplishing His purposes, even though the people in the story are mostly oblivious to the ways in which He is at work. But whatever the reason for Mordecai's refusal to bow down before Haman, it's clear he would not capitulate. The servant spoke to him day after day, probably trying to convince him to just obey the king's command. Come on, God, just, just do what the king said. It's not that big of a deal. But Mordecai still would not give in. And so the servants, they reported it all to Haman. And, and you can imagine, knowing the character of Haman, how Haman might respond to this kind of report that Mordecai refuses to bow down to him. Haman was furious. You see, he and Ahasuerus were really two peas in a pod, weren't they? Both were filled with anger. Both were filled with wrath. Both were filled with self-interest. The Bible says that Haman was filled with fury. And just like a Ahasuerus, someone was going to pay. A Ahasuerus banished Vashti. He had Bictham and Teresh hanged. And now Haman wants to destroy all the Jews throughout the whole kingdom. He's a chip off the old block in a way. Taking out Mordecai isn't enough. Haman wants all the Jews dead. You see, Haman's people, the Amalekites and the Jews, had been enemies for a long time. And this was his chance to take them out once and for all. Haman was an evil man who had arisen to a position of great power and influence in the Persian Empire. And as we read the narrative of Esther, as we allow ourselves to enter into this story, let's realize that this is scary stuff. I mean, they're going to wipe them all out. They're going to take them all out. And it seems that evil is prevailing. And the truth is that sometimes in our lives and in our world, evil seems to prevail, doesn't it? We look around us and, and in many ways we can see evil in our world. And I, I immediately think about another time in the history of our world when evil was rampant and <coughs> Jews were in grave danger. <coughs> You know that I'm referring to Nazi Germany under the rule of Adolf Hitler. But when I think about the evil of Nazi Germany, I also think of a woman named Corrie ten Boom. Corrie ten Boom was not a Jew, she was Dutch. But Corrie's belief in the worth and dignity of every human being, based on her trust in God's word, led her to hide many Jews in an effort to protect them from Nazi soldiers. Her efforts eventually led to her own arrest and the death of some of her family members. But it's clear from Corey's autobiography that in the midst of the evil that surrounded her, she kept trusting God. I think also about the evil of slavery and the many enslaved men and women who relied upon their faith in God to sustain them amidst the evil that they endured. I think also about our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. You see, persecution of Christians is not a thing of the past. Many of our brothers and sisters in Christ meet today amidst great fear for their lives. Yet what do they do? They keep meeting and they keep trusting God. Amen. Friends, that's what we must do in the face of evil. Keep trusting God. Our confidence is not in our circumstances. Our confidence is not in how well things are going in our lives. Our confidence is our, in our God who rules and reigns over everything. We live in a fallen world. Let's just acknowledge this morning that things are not as they should be. This world is not the way that it should be. It's not the way that God created it to be. This is not Eden. Evil people rise to power. Evil sometimes prevails temporarily. But we can be confident that evil will not endure forever. There is coming a day when Christ will return. 
and He will right every wrong, and He has promised that He will vanquish evil once and for all. So what do we do in the face of evil? We keep trusting God. What do you do when your good deeds are forgotten? Keep trusting God. What do you do when evil rises to power? Keep trusting God. And number three, what do you do when the future seems bleak? What do you do when the future seems bleak? You see, this was exactly the case for the Jews. Haman wanted to wipe them out, every single one of them, young and old, women and children, everyone. And so he took the necessary steps to make it happen. First, he led a lottery to determine a date. He needed to come up with, when are we going to do this thing? Then he went to King Ahasuerus to make his case. Look at what he said in verse 8. So when the king's order uh, and, his, and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women... I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong chapter. <laughs> Might help if I go to chapter 3. Verse 8. Uh, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people. And they do not keep the king's law so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business that they may put it into the king's treasuries. Then King Ahasuerus took his signet ring, he gave it to Haman, thus giving Haman the authority to do as he wished. And here's what King Ahasuerus said, The money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. So Haman had the edict written by the king's scribes, sent it throughout the empire. And the instructions were clear. Annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children. Not only annihilate them, plunder their possessions. And it was all to be done in just one day. The result of the decree was confusion. But that didn't seem to bother King Ahasuerus or Haman. They got together and what did they do? They started drinking. The city was in a panic. But Ahasuerus and Haman, Haman didn't have a care in the world. As this decree went out, you can imagine the fear that must have overtaken the Jews. There they were living in the Persian Empire. Things had been pretty good for them up to this point, even though they were in exile. And we see in verse 8 that they had still been able to follow their own customs and laws. They had not been forced to assimilate into Persian culture. Now their lives are in danger because of Haman and his anger against Mordecai. The future seems bleak for them at this point. What will they do? How can they respond in the midst of this situation when they don't know which way to turn? And the answer that is found throughout the Bible whenever God's people are in trouble. What do you do when the future seems bleak? You keep trusting God. I think about Abraham and Sarah. Barren. God had made them this promise that they would have a son and that their descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sand on the shore. And yet they didn't even have one son. They didn't even have one child. How, how are their descendants going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sand on the shore without a child? To have more children and to continue and, and to reproduce. How, how is this possible? But yet God showed Himself faithful. The call was for them to keep trusting God. I think about the Israelites when they were fleeing from Egypt during the Exodus. They're fleeing from Egypt. They come to the Red Sea. The Egyptians are barreling down on them. It looks like a hopeless situation. They're all going to lose their lives. What is going to happen? How are they going to get across the sea? There's no way for them to get across the sea. But what does God do? He opens up the sea for them to walk across on dry land. The call was for them to keep trusting Him. I think about young David facing off against the Philistine giant Goliath. That story isn't about how great David was and how he was able to slay the, the giant. That story is about how that was an impossible situation for David. It seemed like no hope for him, and yet God intervened on David's behalf. 
Keep trusting God. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Thrown into the fiery furnace. No hope to be thrown into a fiery furnace. But yet they came out not singed. The, the Bible says they didn't even smell like smoke. Keep <coughs> trusting God. I think about Daniel. Committed to praying. Refuses to pray to the king. And then he's thrown into the lion's den. This seems like a hopeless situation for him. Yet in the midst of it, what did he do? He kept trusting God. And what did God do? He showed himself faithful and God delivered him. Friends, sometimes in life, the future seems bleak for us as well. You go through life and you face a health scare. And you don't know if you're going to make it another year. You don't even know if you're going to make it another month. You know, the, the diagnosis you receive isn't good. The news is bad. What are you going to do? Can I urge you this morning, keep trusting God. You go through life and you, you lose your job or you realize that your finances are in trouble. You don't know how you're going to make your mortgage payment. You don't know how you're going to put food on the table. You don't know how you're going to get by. Keep trusting God. You face family issues, whatever they may look like, difficulties, challenges. Look, anybody here doesn't have any family issues? We, we, we all face that, right? In one form or another. But in the midst of it all, what must we do? Keep trusting God. Friends, you don't know what lies ahead. You don't know what the future holds. But I want to exhort you this morning to keep trusting God. And as we think about bleak futures, we are reminded this morning that the future of all of us is bleak apart from Jesus. Amen. That our sin has separated us from a holy God. That our God actually requires perfection of us and not a single one of us measures up. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. It doesn't get any bleaker than that. That's the most bleak situation you could ever find yourself in. But yet Jesus intervened on our behalf. He came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He went to Calvary's cross and died to pay for our sin. He was raised from the grave three days later such that if we turn from our sin, if we repent, the Bible says, if we cling to Jesus in faith, we place our trust in Him, we can be reconciled to our holy God. We can be brought out of this bleak situation that we find ourselves in, and we can have eternity with God in a new heaven and a new earth. You see, things aren't resolved for the Jews in Esther 3. They are still in danger as the chapter comes to a close. Haman still plans to carry out his evil plot. He's been given the authority of the king to see to it that it happens. But what Haman doesn't realize is that he is not the one who is in complete control. Neither is King Ahasuerus the one who is in complete control. Haman doesn't realize that there is a God in heaven who is in complete control. And that this God, who is in complete control, made a covenant with His people, the Jews, many years ago. Haman doesn't realize that this God is always faithful to His promises. That He always does exactly what He says He's going to do. That He can be trusted. And as the narrative of Esther moves along, we're going to see the hand of God at work in some very clear ways. We'll see God accomplishing His purposes to protect His people. But what we need to know this morning is that the same God who is in complete control in the book of Esther is alive and well today. He is seated on His throne in heaven and it's there that He rules and reigns over everything that is. There's nothing that is beyond the grasp of our God. He's got the whole world in His hands. So what do you do when your good deeds are forgotten? What do you do when evil rises to power? What do you do when the future seems bleak? Go and keep trusting 